All right, more Occupy with Chomsky. Okay, so toward a worker takeover. I mentioned before that in the 1930s, one of the most effective actions was a sit-down strike, and the reason is very simple. That's just a step before takeover of the industry. Through the 1970s, as the decline was setting in, there were some very important events that took place. One was the late 1970s. In 1977, U.S. Steel decided to close one of its major facilities in Youngstown, Ohio. Instead of just walking away, the workforce and the community decided to get together and buy it from U.S. Steel, hand it over to the workforce, and turn it into a worker-run, worker-managed facility. They didn't win, but with enough popular support, they could have won. It was a partial victory. It's a topic that Gar Operovitz and Stoughton Lind, the lawyer for the workers and communities, have discussed in detail. So, but it was a partial victory because even though they lost, it set off other efforts. And now throughout Ohio, and in fact in other places, there's a scattering of, of hundreds, maybe thousands, of sometimes not so small workers slash community owned industries that could become worker managed. And that's the basis for a real revolution. That's how it takes place. And it's happening here, too, in Boston. That's where he's talking. So I don't know if you've ever taken the train from Washington to Boston, but it's operating at about the same speed it was 60 years ago when my wife and I first took it. And that's a scandal. It could be done here like it's done in Europe. They have the capacity to do it, the skilled workforce. It would have taken little popular support, but it could not, but it could have a major change in the economy. Just to make it more surreal, while this option was being avoided, the Obama administration was sending its transportation secretary to Spain to get contracts for developing high-speed rail for the United States, which could have been done right in the Rust Belt, which is being closed down. There are no economic reasons why this can't happen. These are class reasons and reflect the lack of popular political mobilization. Things like this continue. The United States is the only major country that is not only doing something constructive to protect the environment. It's not climbing on the train, and in some ways it's pulling it backwards. Congress right now is dismantling legislation that was instituted by Richard Nixon, who is really the last liberal president of the United States, literally. And that shows you what's been going on. They're dismantling the limited measures of the Nixon administration to try to do something about what is growing, what is a growing emerging catastrophe. And this is connected with a huge propaganda system, proudly and openly declared by the business world to try to convince people that climate change is just a liberal hoax. Why pay attention to these scientists? And we're really just regressing back to the medieval period, and it's not a joke. Why? They're asking, why should we pay attention to the scientists? Scientists! Why should we pay attention to them? Because they know shit? That's why. If it's happened in the most powerful, richest country in history, then this catastrophe isn't going to be averted. And everything else we're going, we're talking about won't matter in a generation or two. All that's going on right now. Something has got to be done at, uh, about it very soon in a dedicated, sustained way. So, most people don't understand Occupy, but the uh, polls show that there's a lot of support. So we need to educate the masses what Occupy is about and what it is. Uh, what it is that we're working on accomplishing. So that assigns a task. It's necessary to get out into the country and get people to understand what this is about and what they can do about it and the cons what the consequences are of not doing anything about it. Corporate personhood is an ex important case in point, but pay attention to what it is. We should think about cor corporate personhood. We're supposed to worship the U U.S. Constitution these days. The Fifth Amendment says that no person shall be deprived of rights without due process of law. That's the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be deprived of rights without due process of law. Well, by person, the Founding Fathers didn't actually mean person. So, for example, there's a lot of creatures of flesh and blood that weren't considered to be persons. The indigenous population, for example, they didn't have any rights. In the U.S. Constitution, there's a category of creatures called three-fifth humans, which was the enslaved population. They weren't considered persons. In fact, women were barely considered persons, so they didn't have any rights. And also, the poor landless masses, anybody under 21 years of old, years of age, didn't have rights. So, a lot of this was somewhat rectified over the years. After the Civil War, the 14th Amendment raised the three-fifths humans to full humans, at least in principle, but that was only in principle. Soon other methods were instituted to criminalize black life, which led to virtual restoration of a kind of slavery. In fact, something like that is happening again now. It's a process of neoliberal globalization I was talking about leave a superfluous population among the precarious. 
And with a fairly close class, race, ethnicity relation in the United States, that means largely black, secondarily Hispanic. Over the following years, the concept of person was changed by the courts in two substantial ways. One way is to broaden it to include corporations, legal fictions established and sustained by the state. In fact, these persons later became the man management of corporations. So when we're talking about corporations, we're talking about the management, the managers, the management of the corporation. So they are made up of people, and it could have been a legal, I don't know, necessity. But the, um, yeah, to uh, uh, give to corporations the same rights that a lot of humans weren't guaranteed is a dramatic change in our society. So the management of corporations became persons. It also narrowly, it narrowed to exclude undocumented immigrants. They had to be excluded from the category of persons, and that's happening right now. So where corporations are becoming people, immigrants are not. We're a nation of immigrants. I'm not sure if my ancestors got here uh, legally or not. Probably not. If you could survive the 14-day voyage in the 1860s to get to America, I don't see them sending you back since it costs money to ship people back. And also the Statue of Liberty says, uh, come on, come on, you know, all your, uh, your hordes of masses yearning to breathe free, send me your teeming refuse to shore, your teeming shore of refuse, I forget how it is, but basically send me all your muck and your crap, uh, all the other people that the other countries don't want, come to America where you can start a brand new life. That's what my ancestors came to America here for, and they did start a brand new life, and have, uh, uh, assimilated into the dominant culture and lost most of their native German culture. Um, so, let's see. So, yeah, yeah, so the uh, undocumented immigrants are excluded from what is considered a person. They're, call they're talking about anchor babies, right? They're trying to get rid of the uh, requirement that if you're, you're not just to be born on this land, you have to be you have to do more for your citizenship. All I did for my citizenship was I was born in Covington, Kentucky. That's that's all I did for my citizenship. So I would say Mexicans who have to take tests and Cubans who have to swim across the ocean on a little piece of plank, a little board, a little piece of wood, they have fought from their citizen, citizenship much more than I had. And also um, more, well, I don't know, probably equally so. I'm not sure. Germans were treated poorly when they got to this country. They were not considered part of the white, nativist, uh, Protestant, Anglo, Yankee society. They were considered different. They weren't part of the English uh, aristocracy of doing things. They did their Sundays different. Sundays they would celebrate their picnics and they would celebrate uh, uh, and have like parties and festivities on Sunday, whereas the Puritan Sunday was more quiet and docile. Puritan, uh, Anglo, Yankees also, um, English Yankees, they also uh, made Christmas illegal. And the celebration of Christmas and New Year's was something that the Germans have done too. So they brought the category of persons to include corporate entities which now have rights way beyond the human beings, given the trade agreements and others. And they exclude the people who flee from Central America where the U.S. has devastated the homelands and flee, flee from Mexico because they can't compete with the highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness. Remember that when NAFTA was passed in 1994, the Clinton administration understood pretty well that it was going to devastate the Mexican economy. And that's the year when they start militarizing the border. Well, now that we're getting the consequences and these people have been excluded from the category of persons, so when you talk about personhood, that's right, but there's more than one aspect to it. And it ought to be pushed forward and all of it understood and acted upon. That requires a mass base. It requires a population to understand this and to be committed to it. And it's easy to think of things that need to be done, but they're, they all have a prerequisite, namely a mass popular base that's committed to implementing it. Get a mass popular base, and then you can control the policies that are put out there. So, it's very unlikely, frankly. Let's see, how is it that the ruling class in America could develop an openly, how likely is it that the ruling class in America could develop an openly fascist society here? I think it's very unlikely, frankly. They don't have the force. About a century ago, in the freest country in the world at the time, Britain and the United States, the dominant classes came to understand that they can't control the population by force any longer. Too much freedom had been won by struggles like these. They realized this, and they were self-conscious about it, and it's discussed in their literature. The dominant class recognized they had to shift their tactics to control 
the attitudes and beliefs instead of just the cudgel. They didn't throw away the cudgel, but it can't do what it used to do. They have to control attitudes and beliefs. In fact, that's when, in fact, that's when the public relations industry began. It began in the United States and England, the free countries where you had to have a major industry to control beliefs and attitudes. To induce consumerism, passivity, apathy, distraction, all the things you know very well. And that's the way it's been going on. It's a barrier, and it's a lot easier to overcome than torture and the Gestapo. I don't think the circumstances exist any longer for instituting anything like what we call fascism. So, they say, what can you do, Noam Chomsky? And Chomsky says, well, my voice wouldn't help. Besides, you don't want leaders. You want to be able to do it yourselves. Che Guevara says something about, like, there is no liberator. The people have to liberate themselves. So, again, we are the movement. We, the people, are occupied. We are the 99%. We literally are, whether people recognize it or not, um, when it comes to the economic scale. We need representation, and you need to pick them yourselves, and they need to be recallable representatives. We're not going to fall into some system of control and hierarchy. But the question of the general strike is like the others. You can think of it as a possible idea at the time when the population is ready for it. We can't sit here and just declare a general strike. Obviously, there has to be an approval, agreement, and willingness to take the risk to participate on the part of the large mass of the population. There has to be organization, education, activism. Education doesn't just mean telling people what to believe. It means learning things for ourselves. There's a famous line by Karl Marx, which I'm sure many of you know. The task is not just to understand the world, but to change it. And there's a variant of that which should also be kept in mind. If you want to change the world in a constructive direction, you better try to understand it first. And understanding it doesn't mean just listening to a talk or reading a book, although that's helpful sometimes. It means learning. And you learn through participation. You learn from others. You learn from the people who are trying to organize. And you have to gain the experience and understanding which will make it possible to maybe implement ideas like that as a tactic. But there's a long way to go. And you don't get there by the flick of a wrist. That happens by hard, long-term, dedicated work. And I think that maybe, in many ways, the most exciting aspect of the Occupy movement is the construction of the associations, bonds, linkages, and networks that are taking place all over, whether it's a collaborative kitchen or something else. And out of that, it can be, if it can be sustained and expanded to a larger part of the population who doesn't yet know what is going on, it can be a movement. It, if that can happen, then you can raise questions about tactics like a general strike that could very well at some point be appropriate. So the only way to mobilize the American public that I've ever heard of in any other public is by going out and joining them, going out to wherever the people are, the churches, the clubs, the schools, and the unions, wherever the people are, getting involved with them and trying to learn from them and to bring about a change of consciousness among them. And again, this can be very concrete. So check out the Occupy movement. They should formulate a conception of what the policy should be. And if a candidate comes along and they says, I want to talk, come and talk to you, the people in the town ought to say, well, you can come listen to us if you want. So you come in, we'll tell you what we want, and we can try to persuade you, persuade us that you'll do it. Then maybe we'll vote for you. That's what would happen in a democratic society. But that's not what happened in our society. The candidate comes to town with his public relations agents and the rest of them. He gives some talks and he says, look how great I am. This is how I'm going to do for you. Anybody with a gray cell functioning doesn't believe a word he or she says, and then maybe people vote for them. Maybe they don't. That's very different from a democratic society. Making moves in the direction of real democracy is not utopian. Those are things that can be done in particular communities, and it could lead to a noticeable change in the political system. Sure, we can get money out of politics, but that's going to take a lot of work. One way to go at it is to just elect your own representatives. It's not impossible. The same is true all across the board. So elect your own representatives. People that are uh, uh, believe in the same policies and ideals that you do, especially the economic inequality. Who wants to attack the 99% versus 1%? Give the 99% a chance. Uh, our income should not be stagnated. We should have rising incomes, and it should only take one breadwinner to be able to feed a family. One breadwinner should be able to feed an entire family in the United States. Unfortunately, that's not the case. You've got to have two working adults in order to uh, sustain a, uh, a standard of living here in, in the U.S. So something else that hasn't even been discussed, the deficit would be eliminated literally if the United States had a health care system of a kind that other industrial countries have. So if we have a health care system like other industrialized nations have, then we will cure the deficit. The deficit will be... Cheers.
Occupy, Noon Chomsky, here in Louisville, Kentucky, Johnny Tsunami.